So welcome to lesson three on infrastructure security and today we're going to talk about access control. And I have good news, we have uh, unfortunately not really soon but we're going to have two guest lecturers coming from two different companies who will be uh, giving us a guest lecture on identity and access management, in this case with Oracle and IBM systems. So you'll get a, a, a example of implementations and how they work for these two technologies. So um, these are planned for, I believe, May from the top of my head, somewhere in May, so it's still a while off. Uh, they, uh, that's simply because they couldn't uh, come here earlier. So, um, so this is an important lecture. Uh, I don't expect that I will need much time today to discuss all this, but we'll see when we end. If you have questions, as always, just raise your hand and ask. I will repeat the question for the camera and then answer it. So, <coughs> um, once again, here are, these are the learning goals for today. So we'll look at different kinds of access control, how they are, uh, not necessarily how they work, because obviously that will be part of the practical assignment that you look at some of the implementations. Most of this is in chapter four of the book. So, um, access control principles, um, computer security, and well, in, in the overall uh, context, access control boils down to making sure that the right people have access to the right information at the right time, under the right circumstances, etc. It's, it's really that simple. There isn't much more to it than that. And uh, it says that um, <coughs> in a very complex way and in many ways. And the problem is, is that you can implement this in many different ways, these uh, access control systems. Uh, you can do it, uh, you need and you can probably figure this out. Uh, we were talking about infrastructure uh, and, and physical and environmental security last lesson. And you already saw that when you talk about security, you have both the physical and the logical world that you need to be concerned with. And obviously, access control has an influence on all of this. So you can probably see where this is going. You will have physical means of access control. You will have logical means of access control, environmental factors can come into play, and so on. <coughs> a simple way of thinking about this is this uh, schematic. There will be many schematics in this lesson. Um, the book has way more detail about many of these things, so I really recommend you study the chapters for this. But in a very simple fashion, it looks like this. There is a user that wants to have access to something. <coughs> so. He needs in some way to prove that he is or she is who he or she says they are. Some kind of authentication. After that step has been successfully completed, that is to say I have successfully proven it's me on a system, for instance by logging in or whatever, there will be some kind of access control step as well. And this is the step that will determine what, what I am asking of the system, or systems, or information, or etc., is something I should be allowed to do. So authentication is really something other, uh, something different from access control. These are two separate things. And how does the access control figure this out? If I'm al allowed to manipulate data in the broadest fashion, you can think of it like that. Well. There's some kind of database. There's always some kind of database. It can be as simple as a flat file, just a text file that says I'm allowed to do something, or it can be a very complex database in the form of an uh, Active Directory or LDAP or whatever you can think of. <coughs> and if that step is successful, I'm allowed to manipulate the data, then I get access to these resources, these system resources. That's, of course, the minimum th amount of infrastructure you would need for this. Obviously, it's wise to have someone who is administrating this information. And in most companies, you have people who think about access policies. In fact, you have chief information security officers. Uh, has anyone heard about these? CISOs? 
they are mostly concerned with not just thinking about uh, what a nice firewall, let's see if we can tune it and, and filter out this traffic. They also need to think about policies, access control policies. Uh, and once again, think, think broadly here, not just about uh, uh, this user is allowed to log in, but also think about this user is allowed to enter the building or not. Very basic stuff, that's, that's everything um, is important. Which is nice, but of course you would like to have some kind of auditing of this as well. So in c whatever happens or goes on on these systems is recorded somewhere, it's logged. And not just for the bad, things that go wrong, but also for the good. You want to be able to prove every step of the way that your access control functions the way it should. <coughs> there are, these are the four kinds, well, four uh, uh, most common, I'm sure there are more kinds of access control that are in existence or in use. Discretionary access control is very basic and I'm going to take a guess, actually an educated guess, most of you will be familiar with this. If you haven't seen this, I would be highly surprised. Um, what I'm curious about, however, is is there someone here who knows about role-based access control and has used this? Anyone? Raise your hand. You've actually used this. Okay. Inter and you? Okay. I would guess you as well. <laughs> I hope so, at least. Okay. And so I'm happy to see some hands are being raised. Um, role-based access control um, offers up a lot more uh, nice functionality and, and a lot more fine-tuning compared to discretionary access control. Um, ideally, we have something like this. We'll get into that later, but it, it's complex for many reasons and it's not that easy. This is uh, also pretty old style, I would say. It, it's a, uh, it, it comes from the uh, military, mostly, where it's all about security clearances to determine if you have access to something. So it's, uh, in that sense, it's a bit crude, the access control, but it's been in use for a while. You've all heard about this, all these security clearances, top secret, secret, and so on. <coughs> so, um, in the case of uh, uh, access control, Think about it, uh, the, the basic version, discretionary access control, think about it like this. You always talk about a subject, that's usually a person, but it can be anything, a process on a system, <coughs> which is capable of accessing information, and information is called an object. And um, <coughs> for discretionary access control, and I'm sure you've seen these three terms. Where, where do you find these three terms? On? Linux. Linux or Unix, broadly speaking. You have three classes of this on the system. There's the owner, the group, and the world. <coughs> and every object on the system has rights for these three classes. So, um, and these rights, these access rights, are defined, once again, something should be familiar here, read, write, execute, you've seen these before. So this is a very simple way, and it's, but if you think about it, also a very crude way of determining who has access to what, and what kind of access. So this is a very basic model of determining or implementing access control, rather. So, and this is exactly, like someone, uh, or some of you actually already said, this is the Unix model. Um, what you can do with this is you can build a matrix, and I don't mean the matrix as in the movie, but you can build an access matrix. So for all of these rights, or usually it, it's object, uh, you have subjects and objects, we'll skip to the slide that says it, you can build an access matrix that say, or that uh, says, sorry, which user has which kind of access over the objects. Well, you can probably imagine if you have a lot of objects or a lot of subjects and you want to build an access matrix of this, it becomes very complex, but it still, it works. So, I am going to ask you some questions about this to, to test your knowledge about discretionary access control. So, I'm skipping back two slides. So, let's say for instance, look at these three classes. These are three levels of access. You 
are either the owner of something, well, that's to say, uh, I'm formulating this wrong, uh, an object has an owner, there's a group, ownership to an object, and there's the rest of the world, literally. Those are the three levels. So if you look at an access matrix, there's always owner, group, and world as well. And my question to you is, um, which of the, these rights has, always has precedence? So always wins out. Which is the most important level of rights? Owner. Always owner, and then backwards. So then it's group, then it's world. And remember that. So what happens, for instance, uh, let's say I'm the owner of a file. I remove all my own rights, but I give all the rights to the world. What happens then? Anyone can believe it. That depends on uh, the rights, but yeah, it could be. Can I still do anything with this file? No. It's a trick question in this case. Some of you say yes, some of, say, uh, some of you say no. No, you don't actually, that's the, that's, I was hoping someone would say this, that's a misconception. You don't suddenly become a member of the rest of the world in this sense. The file still has the same owner and still has the same group. So that's actually the hint I'm giving. You are still the owner. You've just set the rights to be, well, for lack of a better word, rather stupid to do that, but you're still the owner, so you can change the rights again, you can give yourself all the access back. So make sure that you understand that these objects have an ownership on the owner and group level, and it's not the other way around, it's object-centric. Do you understand what I mean with this? It's object-centric in the sense that how, of how the rights work. So remember that. So, um, access control structures, uh, files have, and in the case of Unix or Linux, if you've seen this before, there are it, pretty much on the file system level special structures present that say, okay, the file belongs to this user. And it doesn't actually say the name, it gives a ID number. And how do you think it figures out what the name is that belongs to it? If you know a little bit about Unix or Linux, you know where, how can it know what the actual names is? Because if you do a file listing, you see the actual names, not these numbers. How does it know about, how does it know how to translate these things? Any ideas? Hashes? Not hashes? There is one file on the system that contains a mapping between ID numbers, user IDs and group IDs, actually. Which file is that? Yeah, the password file. That's where it can see, okay, this ID belongs to this name. So that's how it works. <coughs> so you get really complex and quite boring schematics of, if you work it out into a subject model, the subject has de these kinds of access rights to this object and et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, Nice for computers, for many reasons, obviously, because it's easy to work with, these types of tables. But it's still a very crude way of accessing, uh, or sorry, uh, controlling the access to information. Um, there's a common problem that you've pretty, um, once again, I'm pretty sure you've all run into this with uh, Linux and Unix systems. If you want to give someone else full control of a file, what do you need to do without losing it yourself? It's different in Windows. In Windows you don't have this problem, so I'll give you a small hint. What is the problem you run into? Yes? You can't have two owners. You can't have two owners, exactly. You create a group. Yeah, first you need to create a group, you need to put those two people in it, and, but that, the result of that is you need to have system administrator access because you can't create a group out of thin air if you're a normal user. So it's, like I said, and you can, that's actually the right answer, it is a bit crude in that sense. This is not a problem you have in Windows. In Windows it's as simple as what? Right click, add the other user, give them full control, as it's called, and you're off. <coughs> so um, 
<coughs> there's um, over time uh, more kinds of uh, access control have been added to discretionary access control. This is also uh, present under uh, Linux and Unix systems, some of them at least. Sometimes you need to enable it, but you have extended attributes and so on. You have extra rights that have been added that add a little bit of extra information that you can use to more, uh, well, control in a more fine-grained way what kind of access you have to files or these objects. Okay, so um, <coughs> how does the system does this? The, the rights have, the rights are also important. <coughs> in what sense? They also have a certain weight in how, um, you can think of it, how dangerous they are. And at one point certain rights went out as well and certain combinations of rights are needed to do certain things. So there are access control functions present in the system where these objects get put into and these subjects get into. That's pretty much what it says here in a very complicated way. And these access control functions determine at the very end, okay, after all this processing is done, you have access rights to do this or you don't. And you need to realize that this is not something, and this is why we're talking about objects, I've been talking about files, but this also goes for everything else. And this is why it's called objects. It can be processes, it can be segments and pages. In this case, we're talking about memory. And this is, it makes sense, but it all boils down to these same access control rights. And is there anyone, by any chance, who knows how you can for instance, limit the amount of memory someone has on Unix systems or Linux systems. Has anyone ever worked with those? See some people thinking, what was it, what was it again? You have the settings like U-limit, which you can use to enforce certain limitations for users. Um, the amount of processes they can start and so on. So you can see that these access control functions are present and they, <coughs> this is enforced. And for instance, we do this on the server, the Uge server, that you might have heard of, for, to make sure that you don't consume all the resources on the system as a student. You don't want to have one student consuming all the memory, for instance. <coughs> or, well, usually. So this, this idea of an object is more than just a file. Remember that. And there are controls present. And what are these controls? These controls, you obviously need some kind of interface as well for every, and this is the same for every form of access control, obviously, to create these subjects, objects. Uh, you need to assign rights, remove them. And once again, you know about these as well for the Linux system. How do you change these rights generally? There are ma several ways of, of doing this. How do you change the rights on an existing object? Uh, yeah, change mode to change the permissions. There are others as well. Change owner, and there's another one. Change group, so on. So there are, these are, well, let's call it user space, and but that's the actual name. These are the user space utilities to talk to these system commands, these things that are built into the system and change these rights. So, um, is this clear up to now? So th this is on a more abstract level, how this is, why this is designed the way it is and how it is designed and why it works the way it does. And uh, in this case we're mostly talking about Unix and Linux, so I hope this is clear. So. Um, you can probably, uh, there's such a thing as uh, protection domains, I won't delve too much into this. But um, you can probably imagine that if you would have to do this for every single object, and if you would like to change something for some user throughout the system, and you would have to change many objects at once, it would be a lot of work. So there are methods of grouping these things together, these objects. So that's what it says here. You can <coughs> group them together, define access rights to that, and then you have a protection domain and it becomes easier to manage. That's 
basically what it says here in a very complex slide and it has some advantages and these advantages are listed below so it becomes easier um, at, well I, I won't start listing this it's pretty obvious what it does yes um, are individual extra controls overriding the domain extra controls that's a good question actually so the question uh, from Sander, I believe, Sander, yeah. Uh, Sander's, uh, Sander's asking, uh, so do individual rights trump uh, protection domains or group rights in general? Protection domains or in general, in the way. Okay, so what do you think? Because I would like, uh, there's a, individual rights, do they trump the group rights or these protection domains or not? So who thinks they do? Owner rights always have precedence. Precedence, and not as in the sense of uh, a president, Obama, but only a few people. So who th the rest of you don't think they have precedence? Or they don't ha have an opinion, I think? No opinion, most of you. So um, who thought they did? I saw several. Okay, so Arvind in the back, why do you think? Because that is indeed actually the case. Why do owner rights usually take precedence? Uh, some users need more rights, so you can ma uh, manual add them to those users. Well, think about it from a logical point of view. So let's say we're on a, a, a Linux system. There's one owner for a file. So what would happen if we would remove or we would um, make it impossible for the user, the, the owner, I mean, of a file to do anything with the file, if we would re literally remove all of his or her rights. What kind of situation would you end up in? Unmanageable file. Exactly. You would end up with an unmanageable file. Nobody else would have access to that file anymore. At some point you need to have someone who has access to this file and full access to it. Because that's, that's, uh, that is it makes sense because if you can, um, let's assume the file is owned by root, the administrator who is normally exempt, but you could remove all the root rights, uh, sorry, the rights uh, for a file to the, from a root user as well, it would be even worse. You would end up with a file that nothing or anyone would have access, even the administrator couldn't fix it. It's very odd to do that. It would, wouldn't make sense. So you can, um, in terms of, uh, um, has, do you, are you familiar with the terms of most significant bits or bytes to least significant bits and bytes? Okay, so think about it in that sense. So as, as you move, let's skip back. So as you move from world to owner, this is listed from most significant to least significant. That's one way of thinking about it. Okay, so, um, as I said, this is very much like the Unix system. So, if you start looking at how these Unix file systems are implemented, if you look at the specifications, and they are actually surprisingly easy to read, it's not as hard as it sounds, <coughs> you will find that um, you have these things called inodes, and there are things like directory inodes, and many different kinds of inodes. But what it comes down to is that there's some kind of structure, and if you look at these structures, you will notice that they are bit masks, for instance. And there's one structure, part of the structure that is a bit mask, and if you start calculating and you look at the name, you will find that they are the permission bits for a file. And likewise, there is a part in that overall structure that is talking about a user ID and a group ID. So at the lowest level, these file systems, Unix file systems, particularly extended 2, 3, and etc., have this information stored in them. What kind of permissions are there for who? And so on. <coughs> okay. So and that's what you're looking at when you do a directory listing, an extended listing. So 
ls min l, you get the extended information. And this is being read from disk, from these file structures, and presented to you in a human readable fashion. You're not looking at the bit masks and the, these numbers. And this is where this magic happens of translating this into the names and into these nice looking letters that you can interpret. <coughs> so for Unix file systems, for the, the common ones at least, so once again I'm going to assume we're talking about extended, four usually these days, there is for every object that exists, so this concerns files, directories, but also what other things, and here you see we're talking about objects, what other things do you have? Processes. Uh, yeah, processes too, but what kind of other things do we have at the file system level under Unix Linux? Partitions. Not partitions? You, come on, you should know this. Most of you have had the Linux courses from us. Sockets, pipes, links, no? Doesn't ring a bell? For every, every one of these, this information is stored. There are 12 bits for this, more than the nine that you see. Because some other information is stored. <coughs> and these are stored together with the file. So what happens when you do a change mode? All it does is check, do you have the rights to change this mode, or change own, or change group, whatever you want. Do you have the rights for that? And if so, it just alt alters this information on the file system. It changes these rights to your desired settings. So this is the traditional uh, Unix approach. It's a minimal form of access control. There are some other bits that exist. And they're listed here. Um, the set user ID and set group ID. And what these are used for, um, <coughs> has, has anyone ever seen these? Let me just ask the question first. Has anyone ever seen set user ID or set group ID files? You can usually recognize them because they have an S in them. <coughs> a lowercase or, or an uppercase S for instance, uh, they are used for, um, if you look at a file, they have a certain owner and they have a certain group. And if they have the super user bit set, if you start this file, so for instance, let's say uh, I'm user Arnim and I see, look at this file and it's called test and it's owned by root and group root. And if I start this file and it has the set user ID bit enabled, what happens? What do you think will happen? The temporary user will be and the user also. No. Actually, no. The file will be started. That would be the normal way of things. If I would start a program, it would start on a my user. The point of the set user ID, the name it suggests it already, is, is that for the execution, in this case, we're talking about a program we're starting, the rights will be set to the owner and group in case of the group ID, obviously, of the file that we're starting, or the program in this case. So if I am Arnim and I'm starting a file with the set user ID bit set and the file is owned by root, this file will be started as the root user. Why would you have these kinds of files? Can anyone think of a reason why this would exist? Because, as you can probably imagine, this can be a massive security hazard. That you are starting fi uh, programs as different users. But why would you need this? This feature. Sharing of information, for example, uh, if a person in the group of sales needs a document that a technical guy made, Mm, sharing of information. One suggestion here is sharing of information. You could do that differently. If you were a system administrator, you could put these people together in a group and you wouldn't need to do that. I saw one uh, hand raised. Yes? Uh, sometimes you are used to uh, start applications uh, that have more rights than the user themselves. Like, for example, uh, yeah. 
Okay, but so why p particularly in your example? So the, the, uh, what, what's being uh, suggested is that you need these rights uh, to start, for instance, something like Apache, but why specifically would you need to do that in this case? But why would I, um, if I can start Apache myself as a normal user, but there would be some limitations in this case. What kind of limitations are there? In the case of Apache, it's a, not a bad example, but what specific limitation would you have? Oscar? A uh, few programs uh, are on secure locations. It means if you uh, have to set user ID and you run it on one file, uh, you won't be able to access the other files. If you set user ID, uh, it would be able for a temporary moment to execute the entire program. Uh, yeah, you're very close, actually. Think about it in more abstract terms. Usually you do this because the, um, the permissions that the program would have mean that uh, you, it would be able to access, or rather you, by starting this program, are, access, are suddenly uh, able to access other objects, so once again think about it in abstract terms, that you would otherwise not have access to. So in a very abstract sense, this is what it boils down to. So for instance, in the case of Apache, let's assume for whatever reason we want to be able to do this as a normal user. I can't imagine why normally this is something the system administrator does, but think about very simple things like opening the normal port for which you need root rights. You're not allowed to open any port below 1024 unless you are the root, the administrator of a system. It can be very simple, but little bits like this that you already need this kind of access for. Of course, this is an example uh, we're using now where you would temporarily give someone root rights by starting this program, but this can also be necessary for uh, on a user level. If, for instance, if you want to do something under a different username, yes? Is any, any of this logged anywhere, like in Syslog? That's a good question. Is any of this logged? The question is, depends. Uh, sorry, the answer is it depends whether or not you've enabled this logging. It's really, uh, yeah, it's, it sounds odd, but it depends on whether or not you've enabled the logging of this. Normally, this is not enabled on most systems. If you are building a secure system, this is logged. Because you will, mo in most cases, you will have enabled something called process accounting on Linux, or your, your flavor uh, of choice of Unix. And this means that everything gets logged, <coughs> literally every process that is being started and under what user and etc. and all the accesses it does. And if you're smart, this is being sent to an external system for auditing and not stored locally. Um, we do this on uh, the Ugo server as well. We log everything that's happened. And this is quite useful sometimes. <coughs> so uh, there are a few other bits, the sticky bits. Um, it, it pretty much explains what it does already. Normally, if you would give someone read, write, execute, so let's assume the worst case scenario, I've accidentally given someone all the rights to an object on the system, they would be able to delete that object, remove it. If you, do, if you enable the sticky bit, it, it's pretty much saying uh, the, f the object will stick, it is not removable by someone else. So um, think of it in a sense that they cannot rename, move or delete the file. They cannot make sure it disappears. They might be able to change it, the contents, remember that, but they will not be able to delete it, move it. Moving is the same as deleting, copying and then deleting, or rename it. That's not anything different from moving. <coughs> okay. Um, and of course, the super user is the exemption, user ID zero. There are special things built into an operating system in Linux and Unix that say the root user or the, the person with UID zero has all rights at all times. He or she can do anything they desire. They're exempt, exempt from these checks. Yes? Set group ID for the same reason. For some, uh, for some, you might have uh, set up a system 
that um, you would temporarily want to have the group rights of some other group because you need access to the resources that this group would have access to but not your own group. So if you can follow the line of thinking, it's the same thing but on a broader level. So there are methods of sharing information. So someone said that here in one of the front rows. You can use it to share information. It's a bit odd to do it, but there, you could use it for that if you would like to. So, um, and this is all stored in these bits, in these protection bits. <coughs> and this is the de facto standard for most Unixes. That's what it says, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Linux, Solaris. Uh, and there are these tools that you know uh, from, for Linux, so uh, these change mod. Of course, in FreeBSD, you have tools to do this. I believe it's FACL from the top of my head uh, that you can use to manipulate these permission bits and change them. So um, FreeBSD, oh, it's set FACL, actually it says it. Um, in FreeBSD, there is a difference which and it's a, a, a notable one. In FreeBSD, you can have any number of users or groups associated. So it's a bit different than Linux in that regard. But the overall basic working is still the same. OK. Um, there is uh, something of note. Uh, it says here specifically for FreeBSD that you can have extended ACLs. And this used to be. Uh, the case, but all Linux has this as well. I already mentioned this, you have extended ACLs and attributes also for Linux these days. So it's not just for FreeBSD anymore. Okay, so um, what happens is this. Uh, sorry. It selects the most appropriate ACL, so usually the most specific one wins out. And if something is not defined a certain right, or overridden on a more significant level, as we saw previously, then the, it, it just inherits. The end result is matched against the rights of the file, and you either get access to do what you want or you didn't. So you can probably imagine, it is, at the lowest level, it's as simple as matching two bit masks against each other to see whether or not you can do what you want with a file. And this is very simple. This is clearly for very simple reasons, performance and so on. So you have uh, extended access control lists also. Um, you don't usually see them when you do a listing. Um, this is what you see as the user. On a normal user, on a normal system, if you do a listing, you will see these. So I'm not going to wait on this slide too much longer. I'm sure you're well familiar with it from your experiences. So. Um, that's how discretionary access control works, and this is how you will see it on most systems, because most systems are Unix, Linux based, you will see this. There's also such a thing as role-based access control, and there were a few of you uh, who have worked with this before. Um, and are, um, if you work in a complex setting, or a, well, a large organization, or whichever way you want to look at it, it becomes quickly very advantageous to use this kind of system. And if you work, or for instance, if you work with secure computing environments or secure environments of any kind, it also quickly becomes desirable to have this kind of access control system, role-based access control. And for very good reasons. And rather than think about these objects that have certain kinds of permissions for certain subjects, so you would not look at objects and then determine who has access and when. You start looking at what the role a certain subject has for your entire system. And that's the name already implies it's role based. So if you think about users, they always have a specific function in an organization. This slide is a bit weird because apparently we have a secretary who is in the same organization as a kid, a very young kid, and someone else, in, who knows? I don't know why they would all be working. Maybe they're working in daycare. That could be uh, the solution, I don't know. But it, it proof, all proves the same points. The way that these users interact with this infrastructure, they have different forms of interaction. They will most likely have different needs and different kinds of information they need access to, and so on. 
So rather, like I said, rather than think about the objects and then work your way from there, you can also think about the role someone has, the function in an organization. Yes, Rowan. The group rights on the... Yeah, so let, let's say that role one is a group, like administrators. This looks a lot like the group um, rights. For Unix, you mean? Object, For Unix Linux systems, I'm or...? I'm not sure if it's on Windows. Um, Yes and no. Windows is a little bit more in the direction of this, but, but, this, but still not quite. This is a, um, the, a true RBIC system will give you much more fine-grained detail, and I will get into that. So it, it, it gives you more than just than you, uh, I think you can imagine at the moment. Just give me a second, and it will become clear. So. Um, you can still build these uh, very nice matrix, matrix representations of who has access to what. But rather than uh, think about it of uh, uh, individual users, you start thinking about the roles someone has in the organization. You can define hierarchies. I mean, there's a lot of interesting sch uh, schematics. I warned you already about this uh, in, the, uh, in the Stallings book as well. But, and the overall... Um, working of how you uh, determine whether or not someone has access to specific information. Of course, this doesn't change. You still match uh, the rights of the individual roles. Uh, you have certain hierarchy, as you can see. And of course, the most specific one usually wins out. So the more detailed you get to your exact function, that is the one that usually takes precedence in the system and you end up with you have these rights, those are matched against something and you get access or not. So, um, <clears throat> for an example, uh, this is an example of a role hierarchy. So, as you can see, this is very much and it's modeled after how organizations usually work. There is always some kind of hierarchy. You have the director, you have project leads, different kind of engineers at different levels. That's usually how it works in organizations. But as you can probably imagine, uh, let's for instance, uh, sorry, uh, let's for example assume that this is a software engineering company. Do you think the director would ha need the same kind of access as a programmer within the organization? I see people nodding no, obviously not. So what kind of information would the director have access to, or want access to rather? Directors are usually concerned with Hmm? Reading files. Reading files. That's that's really an access rights, a very detailed one. But what does a director do? He's mostly concerned with managing. So, what kind of information is he interested in? Money, money, more money, and so on. So, usually he has access. He needs to look at the. Uh, the budget and this kind of information. Is he interested in what the programmers are doing in the development environment? Unless he's a very hands-on director in a very small maybe software company and he used to do all this stuff himself, not very likely. And vice versa, is a, pro is a programmer concerned with the budget stuff? No. So this is a different way of thinking about it. Do you see where we're going with this, Ron? It's a different way of thinking about it. Rather than having these objects and rights assigned to these objects to specific groups, you start thinking first about the roles that people have within organizations. I'm not sure how it differs. It, it will become clear now. Because in Unix, I could just make, make a group for a director and a group for engineers and then mm -hmm. assign permissions to certain partitions or files in, in particular to access those. But you can do more with this <coughs> for uh, re uh, many reasons. And I will give an example later. Just hold, on, hold your horse. It will become clearer. So, um, <coughs> you can set constraints on this. You can have an, a maximum number of roles, for instance. It's, uh, this is called the separation of responsibility in most co companies. Um, does anyone know why we have that? It's a very common term. Yes. 
the director, while he can order things, what can he never do? So let's say the director orders a new set of uh, servers. He's allowed to do that, but what can't he do, usually? He has people who do what? Yes, exactly. Very, the ex the, I was hoping for that answer. Pay for them. Who does the actual payment? The separation of duties and responsibilities. Who does the payment? The CFO, yes. Chief Financial Officer. So why is this? Uh, or you could just say to prevent fraud, very simply. You always have this separation of things. So this becomes much easier when you think about roles, from a roles point of view already. So this is already, and you can have mutually exclusive roles. You cannot be both the CEO and the CFO. Well, theoretically you can, but it's a bit weird in large organizations. So and you can have this hierarchy thing comes into play as well. You can have, for instance, some kind of constraint built in that, um, say for instance, um, let's say you're a programmer and you want to have access at the lowest level to the systems, that you first need to be a member of the, not the programmer department, but the system <coughs> administrations department as some kind of proof that you actually know what you're doing in the organization or you have this actual function within the organization. You can build these kinds of constraints that are part of... Once again, this is directly modeled on this hierarchy idea. So, um... Oh, sorry. My mistake, wrong button. So, in the case of role-based access control, I will give you an example of how you can do more with it than with normal discretionary access controls. So the idea of having these roles, that a user has a certain role rather than that you um, think about it from the perspective of objects that have rights to them, is that, um, for instance, let's assume we have this web server again that we were talking about. So <laughs> what kind of things does a web server need to do? on a system. Think in terms of functionality. We're, we're really talk, talking about an abstract level here. So what kind of functions does a web server have? Just say something. Yes. Oli Oscar. It needs to start a few demons. It needs to open a few ports. Yeah, it needs to open a port. It temporarily has, let's assume it gets the uh, rights for that. But otherwise, what does the web server do? Let's assume it's a, it's a very simple system. It reads files, and what does it do with them? Yeah, it transmits them to some other party for uh, their viewing enjoyment. Does it do anything else? So, does it need to do anything else? Yeah, what kind of files does it usually need to write? Logs, exactly. Logs, good answer. So, what can you say about web servers if you think about this from a role-based point of view? What kind of constraints would you put on a web server compared to, for instance, I'm a normal user of the system, what would I usually do? What kind of information? Would I have access to these logs? Probably not. Would I have write access to these logs? Very likely not to be the case, exactly. So it becomes already more fine-grained than you can do. But this goes a bit further than just thinking about these steps or what an individual user might or not be able to do. Um, now think about what a web server... <coughs> Let's, for instance, assume that the web server would want to write a file other than the logs. Could you restrict that with the discretionary access model? So let's assume we are on a normal, traditional Unix file system, and the web server would want to write a file somewhere else, other than in the logs directory, where it normally writes things. And Iris, I think you said no. Why would, it, why would you not be able to restrict this with a web server? Because 
a normal web server on a system. Uh, no, actually not. It's uh, not all of it is running as the root user, but that that would be the worst case scenario because that implies that someone has successfully hacked the web server if they manage to influence that. But let's assume it runs under its Apache user mostly. You can't actually restrict that it would write in other places. Can you imagine some other places where it would be able to write? In the web space. Hmm? In the web space. Um, in the web space. Well, you think of it more broadly. Anywhere that the write bits say it can. So the TMP directory, the pretty much any directory, for instance, uh, let's assume we're on the UGA server. If a student has incorrectly set their permissions, or a colleague has incorrectly set their permissions on these directories, the web server could start writing there. And with the role-based access control model, you can actually restrict that. You can say, this web server, you can build a model pretty much for the function, the role of a web server, and say, this is a web server, it's only supposed to write things to the log, and maybe if it has some kind of upload functionality for whatever, it's allowed to write in that directory as well, maybe it's a gallery, um, think, of, think of something, and otherwise it's only supposed to read files and serve them over the internet. That's what you can do with a role-based access control model. So do you understand why it's more than just discretionary access control? Now? Yes. Yeah. In Unix, how would I implement this? Would I talk about software via app? Okay. So the question is how do you implement this? I'll get right to that. So um, to finish my uh, uh, point about RBIC, and the, the, the idea is, is that you can do this for all the different roles. You can define this for any process on the system, or basically any user which on, under which a process is usually started. You can say this user slash process, this subject, is only supposed to access these files under these circumstances and is supposed, to, or sorry, is only supposed to access these objects under these circumstances and with this kind of, it, it's only supposed to do this with it, this kind of behavior, read, write, and so on. So it's much more d detailed and as a result, you can make it much more restrictive and accurate to model the actual world in that sense. So role-based access control is already a lot better. The downside to this, of course, is that you need to figure this out for all the roles you have on the system. And um, the thing is, um, to answer your question, Rowan, is under Linux you can do this if you have GR security, the kernel patch set, because then it, that, that comes with a full role-based access control system, and particularly if you are running SE Linux, Security Enhanced Linux. Um, this all comes as standard. <coughs> and you will notice that if you uh, enable this, that you get all these extra, pretty much, uh, role definitions for these different processes you have in the systems, these different roles that exist. And you might think, okay, that's great, but what if I have my own thing and I need, to, there is no existing rule set for it as a matter of speaking. Uh, GR security uh, has for instance a learning mode. So you can run the program a few times, tweak it a bit and it will spit out a basic definition of what the program is supposed to do and isn't and it will restrict everything else. So you can, it, it's literally a learning mode that helps you generate one of these files. So if you're interested in this you can uh, do this for yourself and I would strongly recommend it if you have never done it and you're interested in this kind of stuff. GR security, um, if you're interested approach me after class and I will tell you where to find this stuff. And uh, enable RBAC and experiment with it. Yes, Oscar. Isn't this exactly what Active Directory is based on? <coughs> yeah, most of these uh, more complex uh, directory services, as, as it's called, they offer you the possibility to do this as well, exactly. But don't forget, these things like Active Directory, um, they are just, they're, uh, let's be this, it sounds disrespectful, but they're not much more than a database. They're just a database for storing information. The actual enforcement happens somewhere else. And we're, we're really, we are really talking about the, the uh, um, the abstract way of doing this. So 
LDAP is a different, is also nothing more than a database. You can define all these things, but the enforcement of these things ha uh, happens somewhere else. And in the case of uh, 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 role-based access control under Linux, this is also done by your security and by all this, this user land stuff that you have. Yes, Rowan. I have one more question about groups. We've talked about root groups and uh, root user. Mm -hmm. Um, the wheel group, I th well, you're not far off. The wheel group is uh, pretty much there to give access for some users, processes, and so on to certain resources that otherwise the root user would only have access to, but you don't want to have functional equivalence to the actual root user. Think about it like that for all intents and purposes that covers it more or less. So sometimes you indeed you need to put things in the wheel group to give them access to certain resources but you don't want to have the equivalent of running these things as root. But it's very crude still. Okay, so that is role based access control. <coughs> so um, in an ideal world, uh, we would have something like this, but this is exceedingly complex, and you'll see why. Um, rather, what are, uh, sorry, uh, rather than uh, once again read everything that's on the sheet, think about um, a system where you can define exactly everything that can be done with an object by who and so on. So very extensive way. So. Um, you think about, uh, you give everything a set of attributes and you start a varying amount. You can define anything. So this starts to become more like the Active Directory and the enforcement of it. So you can define any number of attributes for all these different subjects, objects, and so on, or even environmental attributes. And you start specifying what happens when, what is allowed, and so on. So it's, it's even more extensive. So before we get into the, the remaining slides, the advantage of this is what? Clearly. Yeah, you have way more controls and it becomes way more detailed and accurate to model the actual world. What is the downside? Clearly. Yeah, it's a hell to implement. Or rather, uh, it's not that hard to implement, but it's hell to administrate accurately and so on. It, the, the workload shifts. I mean, the, you lose the time to set this up. There is, a, a, I think they are looking at this for a cloud, particularly cloud systems, where you have these huge collection of data with massive amounts of users and data and so on for, uh, for doing this, because then it's, um, for well, think about it, then it's worth the money of doing this, but it's not that easy to do this, as you can probably imagine. So. Um, basically you shovel all these forms of access control into one big pile so you have the advantages of everything. Think about it like that. If you can start defining any attribute for all these objects and subjects and so on, you can start implementing the access control, evaluating this, and have very, uh, well, up to the very last detail control of what happens when where information flows. For instance, some things you, that you didn't see previously, think about time as a constraint. We didn't talk about time yet, but for instance, you could say with access attribute-based access control, um, it says, uh, sorry, I don't see it, sorry, it's actually not on this slide, but you could think about time as a factor. With role-based access control, you don't necessarily have the ability to say, um, during the night, these users aren't supposed to log in. Or this process is not supposed to run. Or this information, it's even something that wasn't covered previously, this information is not supposed to be here at this time. Suddenly you can start doing things like that. With attribute-based access control. So that's, oh, the holy grail. But you can probably imagine it's not the easiest to implement. So it's, it, it's exceedingly complex. You have these massive amounts of data that you need to store, evaluate, make a decision on. So do you see here, it, it's all these 
access control, policies, all these attributes, everything needs to be evaluated, a decision needs to be reached, and the enforcement, so let's assume it's everything is okay, go for it, the subject gets access to the object. <coughs> and that's why a normal ACL trust chain, so I hope it's readable, but it says here the subject needs to authenticate, so this is not any different than this one of the first slides we have uh, had. After the successful authentication, the access control part reaches a decision and you get enforcement or not and hopefully access to the object, assuming once again it was a good request. For attribute based access control, it's much more complex because you have lots more information to evaluate, which is good, but it's also bad in the sense of the complexity. So. Um, So you build policies, you, so what you can do, let's flip it around, what you can do with this is you can actually set up these policies for your company, think about what these CISOs do and CIOs and so on. They write these policies and the idea is that you can hopefully, if you've done everything correctly, you can start implementing these policies almost literally into these attribute based access control systems. And the rest happens automatically, he said, smiling, of course, a little bit more difficult. But <coughs> so you have these policies, they are stored, you have enforcement, everything uh, works. And that's, um, that's what you're hoping for. So um, you can probably see why this, is, why this would be ideal for cloud systems, for these huge scale systems. Okay, so the comprehensive way of doing this, uh, identity control, uh, sorry, identity credential and access management. So this is where all, uh, also these guest lectures will focus on. Um, that's the overall term for doing all this. Um, before I go on, I would like to ask you one question. So most of you have actually done this already. What kind of... Uh, comprehensive identity credential and access management systems have you all been using since you came here and started being a student? <coughs> yeah, your HVA card, but but think about it, what, what is the, uh, the overall thing behind it? You have been using this it's uh, anything, uh, you've probably used ADRAM. There's there are many more systems you can name. The SIS. And why does this work? The HVA card as well. <coughs> why does this work? It's all, it all focuses, it centers around what? Hmm? Yeah, your H, yeah, that's just the implementation again. The HVA credentials you have. And it might surprise you, but... Um, these policies, there are also these policies implemented. You don't usually see it as a student. <coughs> but for instance, what the HVA can do, it's, it's, uh, on, it's also called federated access, we'll get into more detail later. But what the HVA can do is for, for an account specifically, they can say disable wireless access, for instance, or disable access to these <coughs> systems, specific systems. For, you might be uh, inadvertently Trojan and sending out stuff over the wireless so they can disable it for that reason. <coughs> so there, this comprehensive thing is in use. Okay, so it, it says developed by the US government, no, whatever. Uh, remember this abbreviation, non-person entities. That's an important one. And um, the whole idea, this identity federation is that you have these, uh, you start combining these systems. You have uh, you build an overall database, it's, it's called uh, identity management, <coughs> where you store the uh, information about a person, you have credential management, you have uh, access management where all these uh, policies for access are stored and so on. And you start using this to do your access control within your organization. Um, so 
how do you see um, if you have, as I have any of you ever been to another university, visited for whatever? I'm sure you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can you do when you're on an, at a different university? Eduron works. works is probably one of the first things you will notice. And this is the result of having this, these systems. It's called federated access. And I see you smiling because you're the t project team that's building this for our lab. This, this idea. <coughs> it looks very complex, but it's actually not as difficult in practice as you might think. You need basically uh, systems that store all the information. Well, as Oscar already mentioned in the back, this is usually done through Active Directory, LDAP. You need some form of access control that's usually implemented in all the hardware and software we have, the enforcement. So that needs to talk to these systems. And what systems do they need to talk to? This access management that talks again to these identity. So you can probably see how this works. There's an identity. You have a certain role within the organization usually. That means that there are certain policies for you on whether or not you can access certain systems. And the enforcement happens at some point that says, okay, that means you can access this or you can't or from this time only or from until then. Anything anything and everything we talked about. So it looks very complex, but it's actually a very natural way of doing this. And this is um, for universities that are on edu Rome. this is pretty much standard, and it has been for a long time. So whenever you're somewhere in the world and you see edu Rome, uh, let's hope it's a legit edu Rome, at least, it means that you can access it. <coughs> so let me ask you one more question about edu Rome because it's a prime example of these systems functioning and functioning well. So what happens with your credentials when you're somewhere else and you try to log in? What do you think happens? And this is something uh, uh, I'm sure that will be talked about in guest lectures as well, but try to imagine. <coughs> what happens with your user username and password? So they can send off from that location to the HVA for verification? That's actually the right answer. <coughs> it gets sent to the HVA. It doesn't actually get checked at the university you're visiting. But that's a problem because how does the location you're visiting, so let's say you're in Luxembourg, Luxembourg City has a city-wide ADROM coverage, so how do they know that you have access? So let's assume you have the correct username and password. How does the city of Luxembourg with its ADROM coverage know that you have access? Any ideas how that is figured out? Any ideas? Yes, in the back? Yeah, that's how they know that they need to send it here. So there's a, they, uh, there's a centralized database systems that say HVA, if you want to verify HVA, you need to ask there. So these, uh, once again, Luxembourg knows, okay, I need to verify the user or have the username and password verified there. So let's assume the, it, it's correct, the username and password. What happens then? You don't want to enter Luxembourg, you don't want the uh, Luxembourg to end up with your username and password. That would be risky. Yeah, that's, you're not far off. Ex that's exactly what happens. The HVA authentication authorization part that happens, it will generate a token of some kind that is proof for the city of Luxembourg in this case and its Aderom network that you successfully verified and it has these attributes that say okay you have Aderom access etc etc and from that they don't actually need for that reason your username and password they know because the HVA generated this for you this is a very abstract way of thinking but this is what happens okay I have a valid proof of access and they give you access, then they assign you an IP and off you go. So that's what happens. Yes? Is um, OAuth uh, also a kind of thing to do? <laughs> you asked about OAuth, I have a surprise for you. Oh. It comes up later, yes. That's exactly how these authentication, these uh, systems work. It's the same idea. You get this token of some kind, with some technology that's not relevant right now. This is how it works. Okay, so um, 
I think we'll take a short break. Uh, let's say 12 o'clock and then we'll continue. We'll do the last few sides. Could you pause the uh, recording? Thank you. In the Dunglish. Okay. Uh, so let's look at these different components in more detail. So um, <coughs> as we saw with my diatribe about Aderome, you can see that these different components of identity, credential, and access management, um, their functionalities, how they are split up into these different parts. So the identity management is mostly concerned with establishing, and uh, you see all these factors in it. <coughs> like once again, I, I don't like reading from sheets, but it is mostly concerned about keeping some kind of record about a person with enough information uh, in these all these attributes and so on to make sure that they can prove that it's them. So uh, think about it uh, in the same way as a personal certificate you would get from some kind of uh, certificate authority. It is, uh, it's about proving that you are who you say you are. So this is different from credential management. Is that clear? Credential management is concerned with authentication mostly, in a broad sense. So, <coughs> and you can see that here in credential management, here it's about, um, for some, uh, credential is, is a method of accessing something, uh, smart cards, uh, this as well. So, in the case, what, why not, in the case of the HA, this card is still coupled to my identity in identity management, and I have certain um, access rights, we'll get into the next step of course, I have certain access rights to certain kinds of objects, uh, informations and so on based on what kind of credential I present. So uh, in case of the smart card, this has certain attributes, in identity management I have certain attributes and so on that define that I have access to certain server rooms of the HA, etc, etc. So, as you can see, it's a very, with this access, sorry, with this attribute based access control, you have this very fine grained detail and you can store a lot of information suddenly. Okay. And lastly, access management is about the actual access and when and how and the systems that are involved in this. And um, once again, I don't like reading from the sheets, but Please remember that it is about logical and physical access and for this reason I showed you my card. It can also mean that you have access to certain rooms. So think back about the infrastructure, uh, think back to the infrastructure lesson last week where I stated that you have these different zones. So you could have these different zones laid out in your systems and depending on certain attributes in these systems combined with the credential management certain cards that belong to certain individual could s individuals could have certain access rights to certain zones. So this is exactly what I meant with complex but very accurate if you do it properly in these systems. Okay, so um, <coughs> you need some extra uh, yeah, well, as some extra systems or, so, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you need extra things to work efficiently with this, and that's what's said, uh, said here. Resource management, uh, privilege management, and policy management. And um, once again, I would like to point to what Oscar said earlier. You see this in these complex systems a lot of the times. You, they, you will see that uh, these resources are also being stored. For instance, you could have them in LDAP and described there, and you could have the policies described there, etc., etc. So you need a whole infrastructure, that's what this sheet is about, this slide, to work efficiently with, efficiently with this. So we talked about uh, federated access. There aren't many slides left, but we talked about federated access and um, some of the problems that we just glanced over with Aderome are, <coughs> there are some issues with this. So 
at the heart of the matter is the problem that you have people that are from outside your own organization, when you talk about identity federation, federated access and so on, um, and they want to have access to parts, usually parts of your information, infrastructure and so on. So how do you deal with this? So for Aderome, um, this is rather easy because you talk about wireless access, May, maybe you have certain uh, virtual LANs within your network where you want to put these people, but that's, you can oversee that reasonably. That's not really that much of a problem for something like wireless access. But now imagine that you have a, uh, for instance, who, who's heard about the uh, European Grid Initiative and Big Grid Computing and what they do with the Large Hadron Collider with all these organizations around the world? And these computing clusters? I'm sure some of you have heard of this. Anyone? But they have this problem. There's this problem, uh, what happens at the Large Hadron Collider? You know this? What do they do? At each other, yes. And uh, you get uh, lots of data coming from that. So what happens with the data? It's sent all over the world. Does all the data get sent to all the places? Do you think? No, exactly, that, that's impossible. It's too much and too much to store in one location, in, sorry, rather in every location. So the data usually gets split up or parts get split up and there are these huge compu computing clusters around the world, at least around Europe, the, European, the big grid and so on, where they can do these computations these mathematicians or uh, researchers and scientists, etc., they can do these computations on this data. But this is where this problem starts to rear its head. So let's assume um, there's a, an employee from <coughs> CERN itself, and they want to compute, do computing tasks on data that is residing here in the Netherlands, at the NICAF, for instance, just around the corner here. That, then, that, then you have a problem because the data that they want to compute on is stored here in the Netherlands. They don't have direct access, they don't have a NICF account. So how do you work with that? They need not just, uh, this is m way more complex than just wireless access. They need some kind of system access, they need access to the data, and this all needs to be stored. And, well, you might think, well, we can agree on a, uh, on a, a specific infrastructure and way to implement this, but as you can probably imagine, all these organizations that are part of these grid uh, computing initiatives and so on, they have different infrastructures, they have different LDAP, for, this is called LDAPs, they have different Active Directory systems maybe, they have different networks and how they are set up, they have different systems for accessing the data. And then you have a big problem. How do you make sure that, how do you even make it possible for them to access the data and under what circumstances? So. This is comp very difficult. How do you know you can even trust this person that comes in and asks for temporary access to do this computing? Uh, <coughs> how do you check all this? And the solutions for this are, uh, I can tell you from, uh, uh, from, these are not worked out yet. There are no complete solutions right now for this problem. And we, uh, we've actually had, interestingly, we've, have st we've had students in the past who did work for this, for the NICF, that is also very much involved in building the systems to manage this stuff, uh, who developed uh, something, uh, you can't, probably can't imagine, but something simple as SSH access for this. Just basic shell access to make that possible for all these organizations to these systems that they had one way of doing this and checking all these identities and verifying all this stuff and enforcement and so on. That, that's something they built on and it took half a year and it was still not completely worked out at the time. It's that complex. You have so many systems you need to communicate with and so much to check. <coughs> so I wish there was a standard solution for this but unfortunately there isn't yet. Um, and um, We'll get into that later, but someone already said something about open auth authentication, OAuth, or rather uh, uh, open identity frameworks and uh, this kind of stuff. It's the same problem. Um, there are now some movements, you will see this on the web, that uh, some uh, 
some popular websites will make it possible for you to use a Google account or a Facebook. It was very popular with Facebook and it is very popular with Facebook that you can use your Facebook account to get access somewhere or to participate. That's all, it's, but it's, it has the same problems in the end. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is nor normally what happens. If you start using these more complex uh, things, you get tons of attributes. You need to start verifying and you need to be sure that you all have agreed on the, the exact same attributes and they represent the same information and so on and so on. You might have several identity providers that you need to check with. So you can quickly see why this gets out of hand for many organizations working together. <coughs> for something simple like banking within one organization, this is already complex because you might have not just different functions, but you might have different levels that state what kind of access you have that have inherent access rights. Um, so you, it just says here A through Z. In reality, there are many, many more, well, identities and roles and so on. So if you want to start making access matrices of this, you get fantastic, fantastically complex tables. So can you see how much more complex these are compared to the previous ones we saw, the access matrices for discretionary access control and even role-based access control. Here you have one role only, but they have many, you need to start specifying all these different applications that they might an application can be anything, of course, that they might have access to. And you need to have very detailed access rights defined for all these. So this is a very complex operation. So once again, it's fantastic that you can do this. But here you see this workload creep, where it becomes quickly unmanageable to do this accurately and comprehensively and completely and all these words. OK. so. Um, The administration of access control is usually a combination of several departments working together. Um, these are some key slides, but it's important to realize that the human resources department is involved in most organizations because they are the ones that have access to the centralized system. This is the same for the uh, HVA. What is the department at the HVA that does this for you? And you should be well familiar with it. For you, it's the You've all had emails from them and mail in the past. The equivalent of the human resources department. I have the human resources department to deal with because I'm an employee. But for you as students, you have a similar department. What is it called? Service. Yes, exactly, the SSC. <coughs> they are the ones who take in, they get this list of uh, uh, student enrollments from the government. And they put you into these systems into these identity management systems and based on that you get your HVA account and all this other information, you get, uh, an, uh, you get access to the SIS, there are structures created in the SIS for you as a student with your uh, uh, grade lists and so on and your assessments and all this information. Um, okay and you get issued a student card but this is all starts at that point. Okay, so in summary, there isn't a, a lot more information, but I want to give you plenty of time to ask more questions. Um, <clears throat> there are many different kinds of access control, and they, well, for all intents and purposes, you can think of all of them having advantages and disadvantages. Um, that said, discretionary access control is old, a very old system, and it's limited in many cases, particularly if you are uh, in... Uh, if you're into uh, compu secure computing in any form or security is a big factor, you will quickly see role-based access control and for a larger organization nearly everything is already right on the right column, complex identity credential and access management systems. Um, so <coughs> remember 
that when we talk about subjects, objects and access rights, that it concerns more than technical systems. It's about physical systems as well. And that is something uh, we, uh, when we ask exam questions, this is often overlooked. Remember that it's just for, for all I care, just think about your student card that it gives you access to certain things. It also concerns the physical world. There is no lim reason why you can't start thinking about access rights in the terms of what, what room you can walk into. So think about that. Um, okay, so that's the lecture for today. <coughs> so if you would. Okay, go ahead. Is there any noticeable uh, uh, overhead in the processing time it takes between the different uh, security systems? Like, does it take more time? Or is it noticeable for the user? Yes. Uh, so the question is, is there a noticeable overhead uh, once you get to these more complex systems of access control, uh, sort of, well, identity uh, and access and credential management? Yes. Yes. And... Uh, You don't necessarily have to think of it, uh, think of it in terms of as an individual user um, seeing that it suddenly takes 10 seconds because that's a bit excessive. But um, even if you're an individual user, if you're somewhere else around the world, it will, uh, you will, let's for instance, you're in Australia and you're using, you're using ADROM, it will just not take noticeably longer before you're authenticated because of many different reasons. It takes longer for the information to even reach the HVA, for instance. So you will notice that. But the biggest overhead is in the amount of work it is to maintain these more complex systems. Because you can probably imagine, I gave, what was the nice thing about role-based access control that I mentioned? What can you do with role-based access control? You might get the standard set of information on how to deal with it, but in case you don't have this, uh, all these definitions for these roles, what can you usually do? Yeah, you have some kind of learning mode for these systems. Do you have a learning mode for the most complex thing? Not really. Maybe in an ideal world sometime in the future, in the future, but no. So there's a lot of overhead both in all the information that needs to be stored and dealt with. And once again, uh, for instance, assuming that we're in the same location and we're doing that, you won't really notice it because all these checks are quick. But if you start doing this for uh, many users, it just becomes a lot of information and a lot more load on a system. And I will say something about that. But um, the overhead is mostly in all this extra work and processing power that's needed. So um, what I wanted to say about that is... Um, the thing is, um, for those of you who have been here for a while on this uh, THVA, you might have noticed that usually in the beginning of the year, there, uh, especially I believe two years ago or three years ago, there were some problems at the start of every school year, at the start of the school year with authentication. And this was because there were so many students every time that they needed to start scaling up these systems that did all these checks because they were being overloaded. There were so many extra requests suddenly that they started running out of resources. So you can run into limitations. And as you can probably imagine, a normal Unix system, it really doesn't care if you have 60,000 users trying to authenticate or 200. There's not really a problem with that. But with these more complex systems, you, you simply have more information to deal with. So yes? In some cases, you will notice this. So, another question in the back, Arvind? Uh, we were talking about scaling. Mm -hmm. If I start with DAC and I want to go to RDAC, how does that work? Um, the question is, uh, in, in terms of scaling, if you start with DAC, discretionary access controls, and you want to move to role-based access controls, um, and that's not that hard uh, because um, much like the extended access control list and extended attributes that exist, so for instance if we're just dealing with Unix systems, um, this is mostly transparent. It happens on top of the discretionary access controls. So um, in the case of uh, GR security, it's a question of enabling this, uh, then enabling, uh, just system-wide enabling that the, it starts enforcing role-based access controls. 
So the first, time, first few times you will do this, you will notice that nothing works until you've tweaked the role-based, all these access lists to your liking, and then you're done. You won't lose the actual discretionary access control permissions, but they, for some intents and purposes, they will just not be of any effect anymore. Or they're being overruled by the role-based access control. And this is not any different with uh, uh, the holy grail of attribute-based access control. It, once again, that happens on top of. It's just a question of bigger and better in, in some <coughs> aspects. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right. So, in that case, uh, I have one.